Welcome to Music Tech Explained the Visual Approach. My name is Edgar Rothermich, author of the best-selling book series Graphically Enhanced Manuals. In this video, I will show the exciting new features and changes in the Logic Pro 10 update 10.4.5. Despite the point release, there are some significant changes in addition to the stability and performance improvements. So let's get started. I also released a new book, Logic Pro 10, what's new in 10.4.5, available on my website logicprogem.com. On 70 pages, I provide more detailed information about the various features and changes that I didn't have time for in this video. And there are even a couple more features and changes that you don't want to miss with information that you won't find anywhere else. Okay, let's start with the biggest feature in the new Logic Pro 10 update 10.4.5. You could sum it up with one word, 1000. Because now you can have up to 1000 stereo audio channel strips, up to 1000 software instrument channel strips, up to 1000 auxiliary channel strips and 1000 external MIDI tracks. Before we get into it, make sure again to understand the difference between the channel strips and tracks, because these are two different things in Logic. If you're not really clear about that, check out my book Logic Pro 10, how it works. The 1000 audio tracks, how you create that. Very simple, Option Command N to open the new tracks dialog and we enter the number 1000. And it doesn't let us do that because it shows 996 because it knows I have already four audio tracks. So I have only an allowance of another 996 audio channel strips. Okay, so I create that. And this will take a moment, a couple of seconds because now I have four audio channel strips. It adds 996 additionally, and here they are. That means now I have a total of 1000 audio channel strips. If you go back to the new tracks dialog, the selection is grayed out because I max out. I cannot add more than 1000 audio channel strips. But if you read the fine prints, actually Logic has a total of 1,003 audio tracks because you are allowed to create 1,000 audio tracks, but Logic itself uses three more audio tracks in the background. One audio track is used for any kind of preview like Apple Loops or any kind, in the, um, any kind of editor. And two more channel strips are used for region-based processing. And so you see here, so you have all the way up to 1000, but the maximum is actually 1003. If I go back into the new tracks dialog, I select software instrument tracks. And now I'm selecting another 1000. So I'm creating 1000 software audio channel straps. So create. And it will take a moment. And here are all my, so let me filter them out. So you can see instrument all the way up to instrument number 1000. If I filter out in the mixer, just the instrument channel strips. And here again, you can see that I have actually 1001 software instrument channel strips because we have an allowance of 1000. And Logic always creates by default one software instrument channel strip, which it uses for the click to have the software instrument plugin, the Klopf guys, to create that click. The 1000 aux channel strips is a little bit different because in the new tracks dialog, you cannot create aux channel strips there. The only way to create aux channel strips is either Logic creates them automatically when you create an aux send, or you create them manually with the option create new auxiliary channel strip or control N. So I don't want to waste the time, but technically you can press control N 1000 time and then you should hit the limit with 1000 auxiliary channel strips. Uh, the whole deal with the one up to 1000 MIDI tracks is a little bit more complicated because the MIDI tracks, they will show up on the mixer, but technically they are not any carry down. They don't carry any audio signal. Uh, and to create 1000 is a little bit tricky because technically you have to have 
um, MIDI interface connected and each MIDI face is up to 16 channels and then it can get up there so it shouldn't be any limitation anyway because most of the people are using um, internal plugins and just with a couple of outboard gears maybe. So, but that's now the new feature, 1000 audio channel strips, 1000 software instrument channel strips, 1000 auxiliary channel strips. That should be enough for a while for even the biggest project. And by the way, that little track display that shows what track you are when you scroll up and down, that comes in handy because now if you scroll all the way down, it goes up to 2000 and even more depending on how many tracks you have. So that's a nice little indication. And here is another number increase that affects the aux sends. Now each channel strip can have up to 12 aux sends, up from 8 that we had before in 10.4.4. So 12 aux sends, not quite 1000 yet, but who knows. So keep in mind the numbers, the 1000 for the audio, software and aux channel strips. We have a total of 12 aux sends and 256 auxiliary buses. That's the number you see here if you go all the way down to the bottom. Okay, that's it for the buses. The next new feature is extremely helpful, but somehow it seems to be like work in progress and I hope it doesn't cause too much confusion the way how it is implemented. Let's look at it. Uh, first of all, you open the project settings under the Generals tab, there is a new setting, Open Project, with the checkbox Only Load Plugins Needed for Project Playback. Um, what that means is, when you open a project, Logic analyzes that project and looks for any channel strip that has audio or software instrument plugins loaded. If such a channel strip doesn't pass through any audio signal during the playback of the entire project, then those plugins are actually not used, they are not needed. So in that case, Logic makes all plugins on such channel strips inactive. So it's either or. Let me be clear, you cannot make individual plugins active or inactive like you can in Pro Tools. So you only can make an entire channel strip active, inactive, which means all the plugins on such a channel strip, not individual plugins. So there are two parts of the implementation. The first one, the way it is intended, is to speed up loading time of projects. So the checkbox says only load plugins needed for the project. So that means if you open a project, then Logic looks for those plugins that are not needed. And if any channel strip is not needed for that playback, it will disable all the plugins on those channel strips. That checkbox is enabled by default for all projects. So you can disable it, so it's per project if you need it or you don't need it. The purpose for that is, think about it, you work on a project and you have a lot of plugins, you try it out and some channels you need, sometimes you don't need, you might want to need later, but you have tons of plugins loaded. The next day you open that project, it will load all those plugins, maybe sample instruments with a lot of samples, but you don't actually need them yet. So in that case, Logic opens that project, but makes those channel strips inactive. At the moment you want to play those channel strips, you click on them and at that moment it loads that specific channel strip with all the plugins. This is extremely helpful if you work with big templates, for example, uh, movie scoring. So you have a template with hundreds of tracks with all your software instrument plugins with tons of samples loaded. So you can prepare all those plugins in those channel strips. But if you load those templates, it will not load any of those plugins because there are no regions, nothing is playing on that project yet. So you load that template, that project with hundreds of tracks, nothing is loaded. But if you click on the violin track, because now you want to record something on that violin sampler, then it will load that. Now you want to continue to record something on the on the press, you click on that channel strip and now it loads that. So it's on a as needed basis. And so let me show how that works. So here is enabled the checkbox. And here I have a sample project with uh, different channel strips to demonstrate what happens, what channel strips are loaded and what are not loaded under what circumstances. So here you can see you have different channel strips. Some have plugins, some don't have plugins. And 
they are all active with the exception of the frozen tracks. So just to recap, if you freeze a track, like I have done here with an audio track and a software instrument track, those tracks will be bounced in place. So that means it will bounce in the background. And when you play back your project, it will not play back those tracks with the plugins and the region. It will play back that audio file, which is saved as a 32-bit floating point file. That means here all the channel strips that are frozen, you see that the plugins are disabled. They are dimmed. Even the regions are visible, but they're not playing on that track because it's playing back the audio file. So keep that in mind. We have that functionality already with frozen tracks where channel strips are made inactive. So now what I'm doing is I'm reloading that project. And what you can see right away is a lot of plugins are disabled. What happened is individual channel strips are made inactive and therefore all the plugins on those channel strips. And now let's go through and see why are these made inactive when you load that project. Uh, the first two tracks, you can see there are no regions on that track. Therefore, these channel strips, the, uh, the channel strip for those tracks are not needed. Therefore, they made inactive. Here you have regions that are not playing because the track is off. You see the track on off button is turned off. Here you have two tracks that have muted regions. They are supposed to be also made inactive, but somehow they are still active. I don't know if that is a bug. Then you have, of course, the two frozen tracks down here. They are, of course, disabled. And here you have two aux channel strips. One aux channel strip has no input, therefore is not needed. The other aux channel strip receives a bus from that channel strip, but because that channel strip is deactivated, so no audio is routed or is flowing into that aux channel strip. Therefore, that channel strip is not needed and therefore logic turns it off too. Now, if you look at the other channel strips here, here you have two tracks, they have regions on it. So they are needed, therefore these are not disabled, so they are active. Then if any channel, if any track has input monitoring enabled, like that one here, it will also not be disabled, even if there are no regions on that track, because it is input monitoring, it is needed for playing back the signal that is coming in live through that input monitoring. Any track that is currently selected, like that one here, stays also active, even if there are no regions playing on them. And the other exception is also if you have channel strips that have generator type plugins, like here I have a test oscillator on that audio channel strip or here on the software instrument channel strips, they also stay active even if there are no plugins on that one. And here are two other aux channel strips, they also stay active because in that one, it is the input is the bus 2 and bus 2 is coming from that channel strip and that one is active, so signal when I play back the project, here that audio is routed into that aux channel strip and that has to play back, therefore it stays active. And another exception is if you have any aux channel strip that has a rewire bus as input, that also stays active. Uh, a lot of if and then, so just keep in mind what happens, but overall it's a great feature to really turn off automatically all the channel strips when you load a project that are not needed. But the channel strips can be reactivated when needed. Look at that one. That one is the track which is off. It's disabled, track off. At the moment I enable the track, it is automatically loaded. So even if you load a project with channel strips deactivated, they will be loaded at the moment when you need them, boom, and it's coming back and you have them available right away. So it's loading plugin as needed. If it's not needed, it stays off. So here's an example with a simple project where I demonstrate how you can use that turn off channel strips manually. Three things you have to keep in mind and they are very important. You cannot toggle individual plugins inactive or active. You can only make a channel strip inactive or active and therefore all the plugins on that channel strip become inactive. 
And even worse, there is no separate button or a command to toggle a channel strip active or inactive. So that's where we come into that work in progress weird implementation part. Because instead of having uh, a separate control, a separate button, you use an existing button and that is the track on off button on the track header. So that one is basically misused for that feature, which makes the, in the interface extremely confusing. Um, let's look at that project here. So I have three tracks, instrument track and two audio track. Here is the on off button. Keep in mind that the on off button is hidden by default. So if you don't see them, make sure that you either go to track header and turn them on, on off, or go to the popover and toggle them on here. Uh, the functionality of the on off button is basically like a mute all region on the track. If I click on it, all mute all regions on the track will be muted. Same thing here on the audio track. That's basically the functionality. If you use the mute region command with control M, a region also turns gray and in addition has a dot in the region header. By the way, in the original color of that region. That when turning the track on off with that on off button, it does not add that dot on the header of a muted region. Don't confuse the on off button with the mute button on the track header because the mute button is technically a remote control for that mute button on the channel strip. If I click the mute button here, you see the mute button enables here too and so they are connected. So you also will see that the, the regions turn gray so that they don't play back but the reason they don't play back because you mute the channel strip. That means the track the information, the region on the track that is routed to the corresponding channel strip that is muted. Okay, so that on off button now is used to inactivate the channel strip. And the way it works is instead of clicking on the button, you use the modifier key option. So you hold down the option key. And now if I click the on off button, look down here on the channel strip what happens. So I hold down the option key, click on it and you will see they dim down. So that means the plugins are unloaded, which means that channel strip now is inactive. If I click, hold down the option key and click it again, I can turn the channel strip back to active. So hold down the option key, click so you can toggle a channel strip active inactive. Again, not individual plugins, all the plugins on the channel strip. The weird thing is what happens if that track is off. So here the track is off, but it's not inactive the channel strip. If I hold down the option key, if I click on it to make it inactive, it won't happen. Instead, what happens is it turns the track back on. I still hold down the option key and now I have to click again. And on the second click, it will make the channel strip inactive. Really confusing. And even more confusing is if I disable that track. Okay, audio track is channel strip is disabled. You see the buttons are dimmed. If I don't hold the option key, I just click on the on off button. The track turns on and the channel strip gets reactivated. Now we look at that channel strip, the track Audio 2 is activated, so I hold down Option, click on the on off button, and channel strip gets deactivated. Now I click on the on off button again without holding down the Option key. The track gets enabled, but the channel strip stays inactive. Why? Because there is no region on that track. So that means the behavior on that track and that track is different. It is also different if the track is selected because now channel strip is deactivated. Now, if I enable the track, track on, then the, also the channel strip gets activated. Extremely confusing because it depends on so many conditions. On top of that, it uses the same button, which has actually already a slightly confusing functionality. So play around to wrap your head around how that works. It is extremely helpful, but as I said, very limited at the moment. No possibility to enable, disable individual 
plugins, only the whole channel strip, but hopefully it is work in progress and in the future update, finally we get the option to enable or disable individual plugins. The next improvement is about MIDI synchronization. Um, you go to the project settings, that's key command option P, go to the synchronizations tab and MIDI. Here you find all the settings for the MIDI synchronization and as you can see that window has changed a little bit. Before you only had two destinations to send the MIDI synchronization like MIDI clock, MIDI timecode and you can select only two MIDI destination, two devices where you send that to. Now you have a new list here with a total of 16 destinations that you can define. So not only that, for each destination you can select what type of MIDI synchronization you want to send out. In the destination you select any of the available destinations on your computer depending on your setup. Once you select it, you select what type of synchronization signal you want to send out. MIDI clock, MIDI timecode or MIDI machine control and you can enable or disable plug-in delay compensation and you can add a delay but remember that is positive and negative so it could be delay so you send it later or a negative delay you send it earlier and so you can set select any other device and for each device you can set the parameters differently so that's the new section here the other parameters, clock mode, clock start and so on, are the same, with one exception. Here is one additional control um, that's called clock start at position with pattern length of zero, of one, two, three, four, five, how many bars. What that means is the MIDI time code or the MIDI sync signal that is sent out is usually sent to a device that is that has a time line. So it's a specific song with first bar, bar one, bar two, bar three, and so on, uh, reference to a time code. So we have these three options that you can select what synchronizes the best with the device that you want to synchronize to. If you use a device that is pattern based, like Ableton Live, you would choose the first section. And because now you don't have a specific bar grid, so you just have a specific pattern that they repeat. And if your pattern is based on a one bar, then you would select that one bar option. But if you have a pattern that is, repeats every two bar, you would select two bars in that selection. That means the start position, the start command is synchronized or it's quantized on every other bar. So that means that your uh, logic project is synchronized with, for example, Ableton. So it starts every time on the Second, every second bar so it doesn't start in between. So you just have to play around with it so to figure that out. Keep in mind so you have song options which are based on bars beat grid and if your slave device is based on pattern like Ableton then you have to select what bar grid if a pattern is one bar, two bar, three bar and you can go as high as I think 128. Next, there are a couple of changes in the workspace in Logic's main window. Okay, the next feature is the updated performance meter. If you're not aware of that, the performance meter is only visible in the LCD display if you select the custom. So you have the whole range of different controls up here. And here you have the CPU load meter and the hard disk meter. That component, by the way, is only visible if it is selected here, performance meter with that checkbox, which is enabled by default. To get the performance meter, you double click on one of the meters and you here you have the new performance meter, which now has a scale for the processing threads and for the drive, hard drive load on the right side. So you double click to open it or you double click to close it. Uh, the processing threads that you see here depend on your computer. For example, I have a quad core. You can find out how many cores your computer has. Go to About This Mac, click on System Report, and there you should see the total number of cores. 
So I have four cores and usually you have two threads per cores. That means you have a total of four times two, eight threads. There's one little system preference settings in the preferences audio devices. Down here it says processing threads. By default it is on automatic, but here you would see the maximum amount of threads on your computer, which is eight on my, in my case, but you can lower that. For example, here's eight, you see a total number of eight threads. If I lower it down to four, you would see the performance meter changes to four threads. So I usually leave it all the way to automatic, so it uses all the cores available for your machine. And one more thing, that meter, because you only can open that meter from the custom LCD display, if you don't want to open that, and because you have the another LCD monitor up here, LCD display, you can also use a key command. And here the key command is called open system performances. So it is unassigned, but you can assign a key command for that and that one you can toggle the performance meter on and off. Very handy. And if you have seen the performance at the W Worldwide uh, Developer Conference, uh, the performance of Dave Earl, he presented that with 26 cores with a brand new Mac Pro they showed off there. The next new little feature in the workspace is a track and bar display that shows up in the workspace when you scroll left, right or up and down. Here I'm scrolling to the right and there it is. It shows you the bar number. When you scroll to the left, it shows the bar number on the right border. If you scroll the other direction, you see the bar number that is on the left border. The same thing is with the track number. If I scroll down, the display shows you the track number at the bottom of the workspace. If you scroll up, it shows you the track number at the upper border. So always you can scroll left and right and you always have the orientation right in the center of your workspace where you are. In case you don't like the display in the workspace, you can turn it off. Go to Preferences, to Display, Tracks, and there is the checkbox Show Track or Bar Menu while scrolling. Here you can turn it off. The next addition is a tool description. If you use the quick help, so by clicking here on the quick help button, you activate these yellow popovers. That means now if that is activated and you open the tool menu by clicking here on the tool menu button, scrolling down through the different tools, you will see a little popover, quick help popover showing a short description of that specific tool. So for example, if you forgot what the mute tool is doing, there's your description right there. Small little addition. It works for all the tool menus, also for the floating tool menu when you click the T, press the, the T key on your keyboard. If it's getting too annoying, just turn quick help off. There's one set of key commands in Logic that has been consolidated. Um, that is the option arrow up, arrow down, and shift option arrow up and arrow down. Uh, previously it was used to transpose a region and events, and now it also applies to nudge automation up and down by one step or by 10 steps, or 0.1 dB or 1 dB, depending on what type of automation control point it is. Uh, here's an example. Uh, here's the key commands window. This is the uh, key command I'm talking about. It's called transpose region slash event plus one semitone or nudge automation up one step. So the option up and option down arrow and the shift option up and shift option down arrow for a whole octave, 12 semitones or 10 steps. Let me show you here. So here I have an example. It's one region. The region is selected. If I hold down the option key and press arrow up, I will transpose the entire region by one semitone. And you can see that here with a plus one in parenthesis, that relates to the transpose plus one parameter that I set here in the region inspector. So if I go up and down, it will transpose the whole region. If I hold down shift option, arrow up, 
it goes up 12 semitones one octave. Uh, the same thing, I can use it with note events. So if I just select one event, hold down the option key with the arrow up down, I can just select individual note events and transpose them up. For example, I just get the last chord. Depends on if it makes sense musically. So that is transpose region or individual note events. And now it also applies to automation control points. So if I select that one control, automation control point, hold down option and press arrow up or arrow down, it will shift up and down, it will nudge it by 0 0.1 dB. If I hold down shift option, it will nudge up and down by 1 dB. So if I hold, if I select the entire region, it applies to all those selected control points. Very useful, should be in your arsenal of key commands. Okay, here's some improvements regarding the editors. First of all, the event float. Event float is a little window that floats, hence the name event float, that you can open here under the window menu, show event float, or use the key command option E. So the event float is just like one line little window that is like a miniature version of the event list. Like if you select a region or any kind of other object, it shows you the information about that region. And it works for region, but also for uh, node events. So if I open that region and if I click on the any of these node events, I see exactly the information, the start time, the node, what node, velocity, and so on here in the event float. Which is the same thing like if I open the event list and you would have the same information here. All the MIDI messages of that region and the event float shows only one, the currently selected. So it's like a convenient thing and you can just have it open all the time. Uh, the new addition in 10.4.5 is that little area here because the event float now also shows articulation. So if I select any note events, you see what kind of articulation is assigned to that specific note event. And if you click on it, you can even use that to edit it. So change the articulation to a different one from that list. Uh, again, with the articulation, just a quick recap here in the track inspector, you see the currently selected articulation set. And if you select any note event, you will see the assigned articulation for that note event in multiple places. You see it down here in the articulation selector. You see it in the event list, but make sure that you have articulation enabled to view it. And you even now can also have it displayed in the popover when you select any event down here. So multiple places where you can change the articulation. The second addition is regarding time handles. Time handles is another feature that many logic user might not even know about here it's in the piano roll editor under the local functions menu the first option time handles or control t what it does it allows you to time compress or time expand selected note events for example i have here a small section of a harp region And at the end, there's this little glissando. So the first two bars are in on time on the bars, and the last one is like the little one, there's glissando going up. If I want to have that glissando a little bit longer or shorter, I don't have to take to change the tempo. All I'm doing is selecting time handles, and I select the range, and now 
I'm just moving the time handles and I'm time compressing or time stretching these selected events. For example, if I do that, then it's faster or I stretch it so I have a longer arpeggio. Again, I don't have to change the tempo, just select the events that I want, the MIDI note events that I want to stretch or compress in time. Just here with the time handles. If I disable it, then it goes away. But now the improvement in 10.4.5 is I don't have to go here and specifically enable that feature in order to select it. I just hold down Shift Option and drag and I have exactly the time handle feature. And as you can see, only the note events that are in that selection are affected. So again, shift, option, I press down, and now I make the selection here. Now I have the selection with these time handles and I can time compress. Next, the loop browser. There are two great additions in the loop browser. We open it by clicking on the loop browser button at the top or using the key command O. And the first new addition is that you now can drag multiple loops at the same time onto the workspace. So now what you do is you either select one, two, three additional cues by holding down the command key or you hold down the shift key and that will select the first one. I hold down the shift key, I select another one and everything in between will be selected. And once you make your selection, you drag those Apple loops over to the workspace. You see a little red badge that shows you how many loops you're dragging over. If you release the mouse, a dialog pops up with three options, create new tracks. That means it puts all the loops on separate new tracks. You use existing tracks, so it also puts them on separate tracks by using the existing ones and creates new, one, new ones if, they, if you need more, or you place all files on one track. So I select the first one, I click OK, and here all those four Apple loops are placed on individual tracks. Now let's look at the second new feature. You might have noticed that little icon here in the header. That is now a selection that you can decide if you want to display all three types of Apple Loops or only one specific type. Uh, here's how it works. You click on that icon in the header, a little popover opens and you can select if you want to show only the audio loops, only the MIDI loops, or only the drummer loops or a combination. For example, here you see all the audio loops and yellow drummer loops. Or you can click the checkbox next to the all loops that selects all of them. Very handy, you click on it and open close. There's one downside because usually the header lets you also sort the loop browser, all the loops that are displayed. If I click on the name, I can display all the loops in by name, either by ascending or descending order, or sort them by the amount of beats. Let's go all the way up here. 8 beats or 120, or you can sort them by tempo. The problem is, before you could also sort them by loop types, First all the audio loops, then all the MIDI loops, and then the drummer loops. That functionality unfortunately now is gone, because if you click on it, on that icon here in the header, it opens that new popover, and you cannot longer sort the displayed Apple loops by specific loop types. There are a couple new features and enhancements in the mixer window. Uh, the first one is my favorite, that if you click now on the output slot, or on the aux send slot, the pop-up menu will open right away. In 10.4.4, you had to use a weird long click. So now it's exactly how it's supposed to be. You click on it, boom, the pop-up menu opens. Same thing for the aux send slot. 
you click on it and you can open that pop-up menu without using the long click. Uh, the only downside is that you still need to long click the channel format button here on the input slot if you want to access the other channel formats. Right now, and as it was before, you still have to, you only have access to the stereo mono channel format if you click on it. So you click and you toggle between mono and stereo format. If you want to access the other channel formats, you have to long click and then you get that pop-up menu where you can select mono stereo and also left, right and surround. The next enhancement is that now you can also select multiple channel strips and it will select the corresponding tracks in the tracks area. Before in 10.4.4 you only can select multiple tracks in the tracks area to select the corresponding channel strips but now you can do it in the mixer and the tracks will be selected also in the tracks area. In case you still don't know the difference between tracks and channel strips, which are completely different things, two different objects in Logic, uh, please check out my book Logic Pro 10, how it works, where I explain exactly the details, what the tracks and the channel strips have in common and what they do not have in common. Very important fact to understand when you're using Logic. The next little enhancement is that you can find out what or where the destination channel strip is. For example, if you have any track here in the mixer and that is routed to the stereo output, but the stereo output is somewhere along on your mixer on the right, so now you hold down the shift key, you click on the output button and the mixer will scroll to that channel strip and will flash three times. That is especially handy for any kind of bus sense. For example, here that is sent to AUX1, but AUX1 channel strip is out of sight, so you hold down the shift key, click on the send button, and the mixer will scroll to that channel strip and flash so you know exactly where that signal is going to. Same thing here, that goes to bus 2, hold down the shift key, click on it, it scrolls to that channel strip where that signal is going to and it flashes. Same thing here, if you have any kind of routing on the output bus, on the output slot, for example, here going to bus 3, hold down the shift key, click on it, and there it goes right to that channel strip that receives that signal. Another option is now that you can right click on the channel strip name and you have a new option in that menu called rename channel strip. That means you can right click on it and rename the channel strip directly on the channel strip and don't have to go up to the track in order to do that. Uh, also another option is you will see auto scroll to selection now can be enabled or disabled. That is handy because before it was only it was always enabled. That means if you select a track it also it always scrolls to that channel strip. But sometimes you want to focus on a specific channel strip and you don't want to have the mixer automatically scroll to left or right. So the only thing what you do here is deselect auto scroll to selection. And one small little detail you might have noticed is the order of the record enable and input monitoring button because now in the channel strip it is reversed so it follows exactly the same order as in the track okay. header. So here you have record enable input monitoring and now on the channel strip the same order first the record enable then the input monitoring and not the other way around as it was in 10.4.4. Another nice little addition in the mixer window is now the option that you can save your channel strip component setup. What that means is any channel strip you have these different controls, the pan, EQ, thumbnails and all that uh, buttons. These are channel strip components and you can configure which component you want to see and which one you want to hide. The same thing up here in the track header where you have the different buttons and controls, you also can change them and configure which one you want to show, which one you want to hide. Um, in the track header, so usually you have either a pop-up menu where you list all the track header component, or you can select a pop-over which lists all those track header components where you can select them or hide them. 
in the track header component popover you had in 10.4.4 little gear icon where you can store your user default the way you always what component you want to see and which one you don't want to see that same feature now is also available in the channel for the channel strip components now if you right click on the background of a channel strip again you have the option either select the components from a pop-up menu or you can open the popover and select here which component you want to see which one you want to hide and here now you have the gear icon which opens a pop-up menu you have the option to store the current setting as your user default apply user default means you recall what you have stored before as your user default or you can revert to the factory defaults I already stored a user setting so if I apply user default it means I recall what I stored before and look at the mixer it changes and only shows me the channel strip components that I wanted to see so if I open that popover you see everything is deselected I only want to see notes tracks EQ thumbnail so you can revert that to the factory default and all of them uh, back there or you can go ahead and open up again and just make a selection what you want to see and what not and save that as your new store as user default so it will store that setting whenever you open logic again it will always open with that mixer window whatever is selected in your user default setting by the way that doesn't apply to the inspector channel strip the inspector channel strip has its own setting which components you want to show and which one you want to hide just to keep that in mind here are a few updates about plugins in logic pro 10 10.4.5 first the sculpture plugin which is a software instrument plugin right here sculpture which is a modeling surf it has the same design but now it has a higher resolution so if you're on a 5k display or even higher in the future it is much easier to read all the small tiny little fonts same thing for the ring shifter which is an audio effects plugin inside the modulation folder right here it also has now a higher resolution so it's a little bit crispier and so you can see it on a nice high resolution display the third plugin, the expander, which is an audio effects plugin in the dynamics folder right here, it got a facelift like most of the other plugins. Now it has that blue design uh, with the same controls, but a little bit different with the metering because now it has the input meter, the output meter, and an expansion that shows you the dynamics that is processed so that's functionality is a little bit similar to the compressor plugin and of course we have the brand new dsa2 plugin which i cover in a separate video it is right here in the dynamics folder and here is a little tip in case you don't know about the plugins uh, the first one i already mentioned is if you open any of the plugin menus by holding down the option key you will show the legacy folder. Usually if you click on it, there's no legacy folder, only the current plugins. It's the same for audio plugins and software instrument plugins. But if you hold the option key down and then click on the slot on the button, then you will see the legacy folder with all the legacy plugins that were available, but not basically out of sight at the moment. And there is even a better trick if you hold down the shift key and click on the uh, on the button on the audio effects or input uh, software instrument plugins then this will open the plugin menu is now organized by channel format here for example stereo mono or if you click on that one stereo mono on the sculpture here you have stereo mono 5.1 multi output plugins so that means it still shows all the plugins but now they are categorized organized by the channel format for example here you see all the plugins that are available in stereo here all the plugins that are available in uh, in mono or here in stereo here are the plugins that are available in 5.1 channel format or as multi output there are quite a few changes in the key commands window 
First, the pressed button was formerly known as modified button. Now you press it, I'll get over that in a second. The second one is the conflicts button. Conflicts button now shows in parentheses how many conflicts you have. That means you have key commands, they have two different key commands, they're fighting over the same command. So you have to use a different modifier keys to resolve that. You have uh, the collapsed mode, you show all the different categories where you have any multi-use key commands or conflict key command. So that means these are not the key commands, these are just the categories, but you see right away in which category these multi-used or conflicts key commands are. So you open them up and then you can see them in this column. Let's go over that pressed functionality because that has changed and is extremely useful. Um, first of all, if it's disabled, so that means the button is not blue, then it's the same functionality as before. So you press a button or you hold the key on your key command and it will show you exactly what key, what key command that key is assigned to. Right now I'm pressing the key A on my keyboard and it shows the show height modification. If I hold down the option command uh, D, for example, nothing happens here. If I hold down option command F, that key command will show up and tells me exactly what key command is assigned to that uh, key combination. And uh, the improvement now in this version is that the key command is centered right away. Now, when you enable the pressed mode, the functionality is a little bit different. So now if I press down, if I hold down the key A on my keyboard, it shows me all the key commands that are assigned to that key combination A. If I hold down option A, it shows me all the key commands they assigned to that key command. Now, if I only hold down the option key, it shows me all the key commands that use the option key as a modifier in the key combination. If I hold down command, control, it shows me all the key commands that use the modifier control, command. If I hold down control, option, command, it shows me all the key commands that have a key combination using the control option command. That's extremely helpful so we can narrow down. If you're looking for a specific combination, you can see, for example, right now I hold down shift control option command J, nothing will pops up. That means that key combination is not used for any key command. So play around with that, extremely useful and use it in your workflow. And there's one more addition and that relates to the quick help. Remember, quick help, you activate here with that button in the control bar with the question mark, you enable it or you use the key command shift forward slash and make sure that you have quick help follows pointer enabled because now you can move around your mouse in logic and all these pop over, pop up and show you exactly the short description of these various controls, areas, whatever it is. And now the beauty is that this quick help pop over also work in the key command window. So if I use the mouse and I scroll up and down, if I scroll over a specific key command, the yellow pop over shows me a short description of that key command, what it does. And not only that, you will see at the bottom of that yellow popover, there is the instruction press command forward slash for more info. If I do that, hold down the command key and press forward slash, the Logic Pro 10 help window shows up, which is like a built-in manual. And that gives me a more detailed information about that specific key command. Just hold down. And if there's any kind of entry, then it will show up and you can read right away. So that means we have the short description here in the popover window and we have a little more elaborate explanation of that feature here in that built-in manual. There is one extremely useful addition to Logic Pro 10, 10.4.5 and that relates to Final Cut Pro. If you use Logic for post-production for your Final Cut Pro project and use the XML format, here's what happens now. You have your project and you export your project as XML so it will have that Final Cut Pro XML file. And then if you open that in 
Logic Pro by using the file import Final Cut Pro XML feature, then that Final Cut Pro project will show up in Logic as a Logic project. So that worked before, but what works now and didn't work before is that it will also import any fade in and fade out that you had on any clips. Like you see down here in the Final Cut Pro project, I have fade ins and fade outs on the audio clips. And if I import that into Logic, these fade ins and fade out will show up on the region in Logic Pro 10. By the way, the import export with this XML format is extremely useful because all the roles and sub roles, they come in in exactly that way in Logic. Like all the roles will be track stacks and the sub roles will be tracks inside that track stack. So you have that whole organization the way you have it in Final Cut Pro with the roles and sub roles exactly popping up in Logic. Okay, that sums it up about my coverage of the Logic Pro 10 update 10.4.5. There's a lot to explore, to try out and to incorporate into your workflow. For more in-depth explanation and details about all the new features and changes that I didn't have time for in this video, please check out my new book Logic Pro 10 – What's New in 10.4.5 with information and details you won't find anywhere else. Don't forget to read my free Logic and Pro Tools tutorials and check out the books in my Graphically Enhanced Manual series. By the way, on Apple's iBook Store, you can download free samples of all my books in the special interactive multi-touch iBooks version, the best way to learn a software application. All the links are available on my website dingdingmusic.com.